In Lythe Strathdon by Charles Murray. Seldom a simmer passed, but him and me among the hills had some fine cheery days, up Nochty side or through the Cabrach braes, doon the Lord's throat and out o'er Benehy. There wasn't a many bare hill heeds on Kent to him and me. Never nae mair I wander no Malin, and he's been bed at lang in far Peron. Here, where his forebears lie in lithe Strathdon, I lay the stag moss that I pulled yestreen, laurels fe lonach, where I range o'er all hill tracks, my lean. Duchas is a renewed Gallic concept which stresses the interconnectedness of people, land, culture and inheritance. But are we connected to the land today? Looking at a modern map, the highlands look empty, but this was not always the case. The subject of my one place study is a case in point, Glen Nochty. Maps can be a fantastic tool for understanding the original context of how a place fitted into the landscape and culture. But here's Glen Nochty as it would appear on a standard Google map today, at most four place names mentioned. A detailed modern ordnance survey map marks out a few more places. But it's only when we look at the first OS map from the 1840s, the names highlighted in orange, and Roy's military map from 1747, the names highlighted in yellow, that we see the Glen really light up. But we can go further. Adding in the Gallic names and their likely meanings gives us the context that doesn't exist now. Look how detailed the map now looks compared to a modern Google map, the names shown in white, and with the names of the hills, moors, rivers and streams, we can go even further in our understanding. Let's go to the top of the glen. It's one of the two crofts my family originally come from. Looks like an ordinary stream, doesn't it? But looking at older maps, we get the original name, Kayachenreni. From that, a detailed three-page article in a Victorian newspaper about illegal whiskey distilling in this very spot. The original Gallic meaning, perhaps ferny stream, perhaps stream of old women, or cowards, and a possible clan battle here between the Camerons and Clan Forbes. And that's just from one stream we didn't even know had a name. Toldichwil, in Gaelic, Toldachoyle, hollow of the two woods, makes sense even today. We know from earlier maps that back in the 17 and 1800s, the site was much larger than today with multiple families living in separately named areas. Such as Duncan Allenach, who is a farmer at Upper Taldihwil, which would have been a separate settlement on the hillside above the present day farm and listed as such on Roy's military map. Duncan's grave highlights the many varied ways local names have been spelt over the years. Just in these neighboring graves, there are three different spellings of Toldyhwil. Duncan Allenach was a farmer, but also a whiskey smuggler, as we can see from the 1803 parliamentary papers on excise. Naughty, naughty, great, 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 great granddad. His son too was the very definition of rioting. Naughty, naughty, great, 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 grand uncle. Oh, here's me, actually using an 18th century map to track down a shieling. I found it, Rierach, and another story emerges of Bobby Ban, who hid whiskey barrels in the Nochti to escape the attention of notorious exciseman Malcolm Black Gillespie. Bobby's story highlights another interesting aspect of the Glen, the past occurrence of colonies or 
comment is people living in Sheelands are with the control and rents of the local leads. Unlikely to be shown on maps, with luck you can nevertheless track their location down from census info and newspaper stories. At the head of the glen we reach Duff Defiance. This place was run by a legendary woman and Gaelic speaker named Epi Lucky Thane. This Shabin, or illegal drinking den, served the best whiskey back in the day. And for entertainment, you could watch boxing matches outside between mountains of men with names like Halfloaf and King of Nochti. How do we know all of this? Well, people's stories were recorded on tape in the 1930s onwards. The amazing site Tobar and Dulachish has collated them all. In one of the recordings, James Taylor talks about meeting his great grandmother, Epi Thane, in the 1870s. Amazing, isn't it? A first hand account of my ancestor's neighbour, even though both were born in the 1700s. See, I told you that there were stories to be found, even on empty maps. Sometimes, though, the Glensfolk didn't want their stories heard. John Milne's song, Nochty's Glens in the Morning, unfortunately reached London's ears in the 1820s and brought out an army of redcoats as the war office feared another rebellion. It was actually just about whiskey smugglers fighting. Even more stories come to light when you look at newspaper archives and statistical accounts showing Glen Nochty was seeing a surprising amount of celebrity visitors and scientific innovation without people ever leaving the Glen. Do you remember me mentioning Duncan Allenach? Queen Victoria made a private visit to Strathdon Church in 1881 to lay a wreath on a former servant's grave, and in doing so, directly stood on Duncan Allenach's grave. I am sure he was not amused. Onwards down the glen to an as of yet unmapped place where John James Allenach volunteered and then fought at Culloden as part of Glen Bucket's regiment. I only know this from a list published by the Scallon Association for the local ruined seminary, which trained the so-called Heather Priests. I believe him to be the same James Allenach who turns up as a merchant and cabinet maker in Friedrichsburg, Virginia. Okay, he probably did not sell the Washington family an axe for their cherry tree, but he would likely have met the family, who also stayed in the small town, and also made the so-called Allenach chair for Lodge No. 4, George Washington's Lodge. Onwards to Belma Bobach. Erased from the maps now, but it once even had its own lead, William Forbes. It's a melancholic place to me, and its Gallic name, Village of the Ghosts, is very apt. It's the last place an Alanac farmed here in the last century, ending some 400 years of documented Alanac farmers in the Glen. Along with Blenamuk, one of the last outposts of native Gallic speakers in Aberdeenshire, now just ruins erased from the map. There were efforts, though, to retain Highland culture in the Gaelic language. The Lodak Highland and Friendly Society was established in 1823, aiming to preserve Highland custom and Gaelic, and they still march and hold games to this day. But sadly, the last native Gaelic speaker in the Glen likely died in the 1940s. Our journey reaches the mouth of the Nochti in Strathdon, but maybe the journey does not have to end here. Perhaps you have stories, histories and photos to share. Perhaps the waters of the Nochti flow around the world, binding everyone who has ancestors back to this place. Perhaps our water journey goes even further. A tip I would give to other family historians is to look for places named after your study area abroad and discover the stories of the emigrants and of their memories of back home. 
Perhaps Glen Norty and Strathdon have inspired their ancestors, descendants and friends so much that new stories are being told in places we could never imagine. Like this wee boulder here, we started our journey with a stream and once we found its name, we found out some wonderful stories behind it. Well, our story of water is shaping new places on the map. This boulder is actually called Strathdon. Looks boring, right? Well, not when we look at the map. Perhaps the story here is that the NASA scientist who named this rock had a Strathdon or even Glennochty ancestor. How wonderful would it be if the ancient body of water which carved this rock, Strathdon, was named after Glennochty? Our local study has literally gone from a stream to outer space. Back on Earth, I hope you have enjoyed finding out a little bit more about this corner of the world.